Hello students, in this video we will learn about a hard hitting poem Elementary School Classroom in a Slum beautifully penned down by Stephen Spender. Before moving to the text, let's learn a few facts about the poet. Sir Stephen Herald Spender, an English poet, translator, literary critic and editor was born in London and educated at the University of Oxford. He made his reputation in the 1930s with the poems expressing the politically conscious stricken leftist new writing of that period. Spender's poetics reflect three major influences. The first is romantic poet. Spender's ethereal lyricism and youthful idealism made him something of a 20th century P.B. Shelley. A second influence comes from the modernist of the generation preceding his, such as R. M. Rilke, W. B. Eats, and D. H. Lawrence. Lastly, his Oxford cohorts, Auden and Isherwood, shaped his understanding of the poet's role in commenting on society. In the poem, Elementary School Classroom in a Slum, Spender highlights the plight of slum children by using vivid images and apt words to picture a classroom in a slum. Through this, he touches in a subtle manner the themes of social injustice and inequalities. Poem Synopsis An elementary school classroom in a slum deals with the social injustice and class inequalities it attacks on the capitalistic economies in which the rich are becoming richer whereas problems and miseries mire the lives of the poor. The poet describes the plight of the slum children suffering from hunger and starvation with untold malnutrition induced syndromes confined to a classroom opened in a slum by the government. They are devoid of any opportunity and have become prey to social injustice. Spender demands equal opportunities for education for the poor and the underprivileged, which cannot be achieved unless the donors, inspectors and other policy makers make serious efforts towards bringing socio-economic equity in the society. These captives in the stifling surroundings of the classroom need an exposure to the outside world to acquire freedom of expression and learning along with the influence of freedom, pride, glory, power, warmth and wisdom of the sun to experience what really life is, what they have to achieve in life. The poem was written during the civil rights movement in the USA. Although Spender was British and the political background of the poem stemmed from the discontent in the United States, the subject is not restricted to any one country. One can see such examples of social injustice taking place in any part of the globe and as such the poem is highly significant for us in the Indian situation. The poet seems upset by both the government's mishandling of the situation and the indifference of the other classes of people who are not so unfortunate. There is a general lack of sensitivity to the needs of the underprivileged. He truly believes in the power of education to transform lives. However, that education must be adapted to the needs of the recipients. It must be flexible enough to meet the requirements of people coming from different sections of society. When that happens, there is a real breaking of barriers and restrictions and a release from impediments that held back and a breaking forth into new realms of freedom where true learning can happen. An elementary school classroom in Islam a perfect social satire is taken from the book The God That Failed. It was published in 1949. The main theme of the poem is to highlight the plight of underprivileged children that are the so-called beneficiaries of government-funded education. Although the poem is a sharp commentary on the striking divide between the classes of society, it ends on an optimistic note 
believing that there still exist visionaries in society who will hearken to the cause of the less fortunate in our societies. Here is a summary of the poem, An Elementary School Classroom in a Slum by Stephen Spender. The poet begins the poem by illustrating a handful of students sitting inside a classroom in a slum school. The children are far removed from the waves and the breeze and are deprived of sun and fresh air. They seem like rootless weeds, thin, weak and unwanted with their hair scattered around their pale and colorless faces. The poet describes a tall girl sitting with her head bowed down as if she is a wilting flower. Not far from her, he notices a boy, frail and sickly, seemingly made from paper and with eyes like those of a rat's. Another boy in the class has twisted bones, a genetic disorder that he seems to have inherited along with the poverty. In contrast to these two, a sweet, quiet boy sits almost unnoticed at the back of the dim class. He appears to be daydreaming. The poet imagines that he might be yearning to play freely like a squirrel on a tree far away from his current boxed-in surroundings. The poet then describes the environment in the classroom. The walls, painted sour cream, are dingy and are decorated with donated things, a picture of Shakespeare, an image of the dawn over a city, a painting of a flower-decked mountain valley and, most significantly, a map depicting the world. These things represent a world of beauty learning and joy that is far removed from the student's world. For them, the reality is the grey fog outside the windows, a life full of adversity. The reality includes narrow streets and grey skies, which are stifling and which offer no chance at betterment. Thus, their life is in stark contrast to the world described in their books. For the children, the words of their books are meaningless. Next, the poet speaks of Shakespeare and the map as being negative influences. They are wicked because the things the students see on the map or read in their books only function as temptation. The lives of the children are led in the dim and cramped reality of the slum. The children of the slum have a deprived existence. They are undernourished with their bones showing through skin. Even the spectacles some children require are made of cracked glass with heavy steel frames. They are forced to meet their needs with substandard and broken things, perhaps those that are discarded by the rich. The poet laments the fact that the existence of these children revolves around foggy slums. He declares in anger that the classroom maps should be covered with slums because most of these children will experience nothing else in their lives. In the end, the poet pleads to the authorities, school governors or inspectors or even visitors to help these children break out of their limited existence. The children should be allowed to escape the repressive environment of the slum and the narrow windows which have doomed them to a life of misery and deprivation. They should be able to live a life that all children have a right to, playing out in the open in the green fields under blue skies and the bright sun, and reading and learning. The last few lines are strongly expressive of the poet's wish for the children to live a fulfilling and natural life. The poet hopes that the children's future will be bright and that they will be able to successfully utilize the education that they get. Now let's read the text, stanza 1. Far, far from gusty waves, these children's faces like rootless weeds, the hair torn round their pallor, the tall girl with a weighed down head, the paper seeming boy with rat's eyes, the stunted unlucky hair of twisted bones reciting a father's null disease his lesson from his desk. At back, of the dim class, one unnoted sweet and young, 
His eyes live in a dream of squirrel's game in tree room other than this. The opening stanza of poem provides a clear dreary depiction of the students in the classroom. The opening line of the poem uses an image to contrast the slum children's faces with those of others. The image used is gusty waves indicating brightness, verve and animation. But these are missing from the faces of these children. The next image of rootless weeds produces double effect. Weeds indicate being unwanted and rootless indicates not belonging. The slum children are like rootless weeds, unwanted by society and not belonging to society. They are uncombed here, fall on their pale faces. First child is a tall girl with a weighed down head. This girl is physically and emotionally exhausted, as if all life has been dredged from her body and sapped from her mind. Her classmates are in no better condition. The paper-seeming boy with rat's eyes is paper-thin and weak. His eyes are defensive and scared, like a scavenger a rat. His eyes might be searching for food like rats' eyes do. His prospect for survival, let alone success, is bleak. Another student, the stunted, unlucky hair of twisted bones, is the victim of a genetic disorder. Spender writes that the boy has inherited his father's null disease. He has been left disfigured, trapped in a physically challenged body. Spender has used the word reciting to show that in addition of studying, reciting the lesson, the boy shows or recites his inherited crippling disease in the class. Spender then describes the boy at the back of the dim class, stating his eyes live in a dream. This last student represents a glimmer of hope. He has lost his mind to the squirrel's game. There is a little or no expectation that they will succeed. And the best they can hope for is to keep their sanity and not fall victim to a fake reality. Beneath it all, the boy's dreaming eyes may harbor an honest desire for true success. Stanza 2 On sour cream walls, donations, Shakespeare head, cloudless at dawn, civilized dome riding all cities, bell, flowery, Tyrolese valley, open-handed map, awarding the world its world. And yet, for these children, these windows, not this map, their world, where all their future is painted with the fog, a narrow street sealed in with a lit sky, far, far from rivers, capes and stars of words. The dingy, unpleasant atmosphere of the class is highlighted by the use of sour cream walls. The effectiveness of the phrase can be understood by the fact that sour cream catches both senses, smell and sight of the reader. The room is filled with donations including a Shakespeare's bust, an open-handed map and then a painting of beautiful Tyrolese Valley. This is the version of the world provided to the students. However, this version of the world so provided, avoiding the world, its world, does not match the world they actually live in. The map does not provide an honest portrayal of the real world. This honest portrayal is instead presented by the windows of the classroom through which these children can view the day-to-day -day hardship they have to endure and the pathetic conditions they live in. The children have a bleak future beyond the classroom and the window opens to the view of a place where all their future is painted with fog. This is in sharp contrast to the beautiful Tyrolese painting donated to the classroom. The narrow streets seem to represent the narrow prospect the children have and the lit sky which seals the roof is to signify the limits beyond which the children will never be able to move. 
literally the lead is a testimony of air pollution caused by industrialization one of the direct causes for the creation of slums and the wretched conditions in which these children find themselves this grim reality is far far from the romantic image of the river the valley and scenes created by hollow words of the poets stanza 3 surely shakespeare is wicked the map a bad example with ships and sun and love tempting them to steal for lives that slyly turn in their cramped holes from fog to endless night on their slug heap these children view skins peeped through by bones and spectacles of steel with mended glass like bottle bits on stones all of their time and space a foggy slum so blot their maps with slums as big as doom the children of the slum are fighting the battle of life unarmed they are troubled by disease and despair for them shakespeare is wicked and map a bad example the literary excellence of shakespeare and the scenic beauty portrayed in the map cannot relieve them from their despair for these slum children the literary excellence is a far fetched thing and hence seems wicked the map on the wall gives them false aspirations as it makes them aware of the beautiful world given by god the world of these children is confined to the narrow streets of the slums therefore map is a very bad example the ship sun and love symbolize joy and happiness which these children are deprived of their only experience is that of hunger and poverty to reach out to the world beyond these children are sometimes tempted to adopt wrong means even stealing to fulfill their dreams therefore shakespeare is wicked these slum children live in cramped holes striving and struggling for survival in the small dirty rooms from fog to endless night from foggy mornings till long endless nights trying to make both ends meet they live in unhealthy filthy holes slyly turn here means they secretly turn around in their cramped holes trying to spend endless nights the slum children live on slag heaps now slag heap is piles of waste material their world is full of dirt and garbage and they spend their life raking these slag heaps the children wear skins peeped through by bones that means that they are very weak and undernourished they look like skeletons as their bones peep through their thin skin they wear discarded spectacles by the rich which is also mended this also shows that their life is as hard as steel their life is like bottle bits on stone since it is shattered and broken like bits of bottle on a stone they are deprived of even the basic amenities of life their world is comprised of the foggy slums where they live nightmares slums are the reality for these children their home where they spend their life for them life is worse than death these slums are stalking the world just like death stalks victims any time anywhere the maps displayed in their classroom are no reality for them they cannot locate their slum in that map it is urgently required to give these slum inhabitants means and opportunities to lead a dignified and civilized life and bolt out these slums stanza 4 unless governor inspector visitor the map becomes their window and these windows that shut upon their lives like catacombs break or break open till they break the town and show the children to green fields and make their world run azure on gold sands and let their tongues run naked into books the white and green leaves open history theirs whose language is the sun 
In the last stanza, Spender replaces pessimism with hope and a plea for a new proposal for the children. He is urging governor, inspector, visitor to all to join hands in order to educate and uplift these children. Then the map becomes their window from where they can see the world beyond their slums. Since they are confined to the slums, these sights and glimpses are shut upon them as they are deprived of all opportunities and means. Their lives are shut up in the symmetries of these slums where they slither and slog to make both ends meet. These windows shut upon their lives like catacombs. Now, catacombs are underground tunnels used for burying dead people. He uses the words break o break open to say that they have to break out from the miserable hopeless life of the slum so that they can wander beyond the slums and their town onto the green fields and golden sands indicating the unlimited world. Pender further hopes that the children will be able to let their tongues run naked into books the white and green leaves open. So if these children get the opportunity like other children get, they can get good education through which they can spread the light and awareness to all, thus eradicating poverty and darkness. Break or break open till they break the town. This suggests that the poet hopes that these children will break free from their morbid life, from the chains of the slums. He appeals to those in power to liberate these children from the miserable slums and enable them to breathe in the fresh, beautiful and healthy environment away from the foggy slums. They should be able to spend time in the open green fields and let them run free on the golden sands. Their world should not be confined to the horrifying place. The poet visualizes freedom for these children. He wants a carefree life where they get economic and social justice, where they have the right to be happy. These slum children should be able to enjoy the fundamental right of education. Otherwise, their lives will be miserable and unfulfilled without the world of books. They should be able to learn not from the books alone, but also from the world, the nature around them. The poet ends on a note of positivity and wants opportunities to be available to these children. The people who strive for knowledge are the ones who create history. The ones who are let free are the ones who will create history. People who outshine others, who glow like the sun, who break free from the constraints of their restricted life are the ones who create history. The poet has used ample of poetic devices. The first one is metaphor, where he has made indirect comparisons. For example, gusty waves. Here, the privileged children are compared to gusty waves, who are energetic and exuberant. Sour cream walls. Here, walls are described to be dull as sour cream. Weighed down head. Here, the head of the girl is weighed down by the burdens of the world. She feels depressed, ill and exhausted. Paper seeming boy. Now, it's a metaphor for a malnourished boy who is as thin as paper. Rat's eye. Suggest boy's timidity and anxiety. Timid like a rat who searches for food and security. Reciting father's null disease. Now, the boy described by the poet has stunted growth and deformed bones. The poet says that the boy has inherited this deformity from his father. He is heir to poverty and disease. Then we have painted with a fork. Now, as fog blurs one's vision in winters, the slum children's future is blurred by hopelessness and lack of empathy. Then we have narrow street sealed in with the lead. Lead sky is dark and dull, just as the metal whereas that sky is normally bright. There is no hope for the slum children. 
Stars of words refers to the words or literature written by writers like Shakespeare that create images which are as bright and beautiful like stars. From fog to endless night refers to future of slum children which is without any ray of hope and can go from bad to worse making it like endless night. Weir skins peep through by bones refers to emaciated bodies of the children which is reduced to mere skin and bones. Let their tongues run naked into refers to the act of allowing children to experience the life as depicted in the books or giving the children an experience of the beautiful bright world outside the depressing confines of the slum. Language is the sun is used to present strength of language. The next poetic device used is simile. Here the poet has made direct comparisons with the words like and as. Like rootless weeds, here the poet is referring to their untidy and unkempt hair and also tells that these children lack proper nutrition and are unwanted like weeds. Like bottle bits on stones, slum children sitting on the slag heap look like the bits and pieces of glass shattered against a stone. Their hopes, aspirations, ambitions and lives also lie shattered and neglected. Like catacombs, slum children dwell in dark and dingy rooms which resemble catacombs. The windows of these rooms look like the lids of catacombs. Slums as big as dooms. Now here the poet is talking about slum where life is worse than death. It is like living in a hell. The next poetic device is personification. Gusty waves as the waves have been given the human quality of being gusty. Likewise we can see use of personification in the phrases tongue run naked and riding all cities. Then we have antithesis. We can find this poetic device in the phrases like cloudless at dawn, avoiding the world, its world and from fog to endless night. Cloudless at dawn as cloudless and dawn are two opposing ideas. Similarly, the word fog and endless night are two opposing ideas. The next poetic device is climax. Rivers, capes, stars of words, ships and sun and love. We can find climax here as the words are written in ascending order. Here I would also like to mention that in the phrase unless governor, inspector, visitor, the figure of speech used is anticlimax since the words are written in descending order. The poet has also used pun, symbolism and imagery. We can find pun in reciting, sour cream and lead sky. Now if we see reciting, the literal meaning here is the boy is reciting the lesson. But if we see the figurative meaning, he is more prominently reciting his father's disease that is repeating his father's disease of twisted bones and deformity which has been passed down through generations. The literal meaning of sour cream is the neglected walls have turned dirty yellow. But if we see the figurative meaning, we see a dismal place where all dreams would turn sour. Let sky literally mean sky polluted with industrial fumes. But figuratively it means a sky that does not open opportunities but weighs down heavily blocking all escape from the slums. The poet has also used numerous symbols like squirrel's game that means that something 
helps the child to escape the grim reality of his surroundings. Civilized dome riding all cities. Here are the cities that show the progress of the civilization and its marvelous architecture. Open handed map, a map drawn arbitrarily by the people in power and the privileged. Slums as big as doom. The grim reality of the lives of the slum children. Fog shows bleak and unclear future. Ships and sun symbolize adventure and beautiful land offering opportunities. Slag heap tells about industrial waste, toxic filth and squalor. Windows are windows of slum classroom that do not open out to the opportunities. Green fields, gold sand symbolize color, happiness, nature and golden opportunities. White and green leaves symbolize learning from pages of books and nature. Run Azure talks about the experience which these children should get. Sun is symbol of enlightenment, clarity, equality, purity and strength. Spender has also used repetition, refrain and alliteration. Repetition in the line break or break open till they break and the phrase far, far. Refrain is used in far, far from to stress on the idea that these have-nots of the society are far from normal life. Alliteration in far, far from surely Shakespeare and from fog, where the letters F and S have been repeated. The poem is in free verse and that is why it does not have any rhyme scheme. The tone of the poem is pensive, belligerent and optimistic. Since the poet starts with pensive tone, gradually his tone becomes belligerent and at the end his tone changes to the optimistic one. Stephen Spender has made extensive use of imagery in his poem, mainly to highlight the message of the poem and the central theme. Some of the most important images that come to mind and their relevance include the ones mentioned below. Gusty waves. The image symbolizes energy, inertia, movement, things that are missing in the lives of the children in the slum. Rootless weeds. The image symbolizes rootlessness, the lack of permanence. It signifies uncertainty, drifting where the wind blow, lack of direction and control over one's fate. Paper seeming boy, rat's eye, weighed down head, twisted bones. These are images pertaining to the condition of the children in the school. They are malnourished, hungry and weak. Sour cream wall. The image symbolizes dullness, gloom, an atmosphere of hopelessness and an overall sense of foreboding. Let sky. The image symbolizes gloom, darkness, a feeling of being imprisoned, boxed in, a feeling of being trapped, imprisoned inside a slum, trapped in poverty. Slag heap, spectacles of steel, bottle bits on stone. Now these create an image that reminds us of an industrial wasteland, a junkyard with junk made of iron and steel, all symbolizing a sense of living on top of a wasteland, a garbage dump or a junkyard. There is a strong sense of dehumanization of the children. Cramped holes. The children in the slum school live in cramped spaces. There is a sense of overcrowded home and a life of compromise. Green field, gold sand, green leaves. These are images that represent the world of progress, freedom, prosperity and general well-being. This is the world that has been denied to the children in the elementary school classroom. Now try to evaluate yourself by answering the following questions. Explain the phrases in about 30 to 40 words. 
reciting a father's nal disease his eyes live in a dream sealed in with the lit sky from fog to endless night also tell what is the significance of the use of window fog lit catacomb and spectacles of steel that's all in this video hope this video answers all your queries keep learning keep practicing until the next video thank you